So I'm going to good morning or afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. And a very warm welcome to our webinar on gamification in education with Kevin Bell from AWS. So firstly, I'll just give a little bit of an overview in terms of what Kevin and I are going to do. We're going to have about a 20 minute chat and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions and answers from you all. And feel free to put those questions in the chat function and we can come to them um, at the end. So uh, firstly, a very warm welcome to Kevin. Kevin, it's great to have you with us here and thank you for taking the time to do so. I'm going to give the audience a bit of a background on you, what I know about what you've done. And then I'd like to actually hand it over to you and perhaps give a bit more information on what you've been doing over, over the years. So Kevin, yeah. as I said, he is the um, head of higher education and research ANZ at AWS. He is renowned as a world expert in gamification, having done his doctorate at, on the subject at the University of Pennsylvania in the US. So, uh, Kevin, it'll be interesting to hear how you went from Newcastle, and I think you were in Japan for a while, and into the US, and now back in Australia. So, quite a journey there. So, mm -hmm. Kevin is also, his book was then published by the John Hopkins University Press, No Mean Feet, and it's called Game On, and it is available in, in Amazon. I would recommend mm -hmm. for anybody interested in gamification in education to do a deep dive into the book. There's some fantastic research in terms of that that's provided, but also some really practical ways that we can, as educators, we can introduce gamification in terms of engaging students and indeed learners more broadly. Um, Kevin is so obviously a published author. He's also a visionary leader and well known for this and also his innovative kind of mindset and innovation in education. Kevin is also um, a team player. There's no question about that, as colleagues would say. And another thing he probably wouldn't say about himself but others say about him is that Kevin really gets things done. So a person of his word, if he says he's going to deliver, he does indeed, which is something, of course, we all greatly admire. So, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to say that it's something that I've certainly seen in the dealings that I've had with you as well. So really keen to hear more about how you came about to be this leader in gamification, what drove you to kind of get behind it. So, Kevin, I'm going to hand over to you and tell us a little bit more about yourself and then we'll jump into some questions. Sure, and and thanks for that introduction, Grania. That's that's uh, very flattering. And and uh, as we mentioned just in the in the kickoff, as we were warming up, it's great that people are coming in from different locations around the world. And I think this community we've got sharing ideas, particularly around kind of motivation and engagement in education, is is critical at this time, given you know post COVID and and technology as it's emerged. Um, your overview was super. Um, just a couple of bit of flavor points. I am from Newcastle in, in the Northeast of England, not the Australian one. I just actually bumped into a colleague of mine, not a colleague, a, 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 a coworker in the uh, coffee area at, here at AWS who, who was quizzing me as to where the heck I was from because my accent's a bit all over the place. If I go full Newcastle, I'll lose you all. But I did spend time, as Granny said, in Japan and then moved across to the US where I was fortunate I stumbled on a master's degree that I really was intrigued by. There was at a small liberal arts college, but the graduate center, which had been set up by this innovative young president called Paul LeBlanc, who was at Marlborough College at the time. Um, and I studied there, it was, it was an early hybrid program. And, and it was in, I was based in Vermont at the time. So we were in the wilderness in Vermont on a dial-up. And yet I was kind of intrigued by the community that we managed to get among our cohort of people who were buzzing each other at you know two in the morning, we had synchronous sessions. I being me made the stupid joke, does anyone mind if I smoke in class? I don't smoke, but it was just, you know, it was a thing. Um, and it was that juxtaposition of being with people yet being apart and being able to collaborate with people despite being in different areas, sometimes different time zones. And it kind of fascinated me. And since then I've kind of kept on that path of just looking at how we can make we can make environments engaging, how we can bring people in. And as my career developed, I kind of got into um, developing online environments, particularly with institutions whose mission involved um, underrepresented minorities. And that really struck a chord. My dad was a school teacher in, in the northeast of England in Newcastle, and he taught in some really rough schools where, you know, kids would quite often fall by the wayside. And throughout his retired life, a lot of kids, young adults, adults would come up to him and say, 
you know, you kind of really switched me on. And, and my dad was into classical music and, and literature, not necessarily things that you would immediately plug into, you know, working class, tough lives. And yet he did manage to connect some of these kids who then went on to have careers, um, you know, that were that were very decent. And, and as they'd said to him, if it hadn't been for you, I probably would have ended up in jail, which was maybe an exaggeration. <laughs> but it struck me that you could change lives um, through education. And, and I saw technology as an amplifier for that and a means of getting to people, you know, now I'm in Australia and there are people in the outback and places that just can't make it to a campus, although we'd all love to do that. Um, so how can we make that experience equitable so they have an, a, an equivalent experience, at least to a face to face? And in some cases, maybe even better, because we're leveraging tools and systems that can really be powerful and really engage people. So always been fascinated in that been really fortunate to stumble and bump into people who've been doing great work and I've channeled some of that and about a year and a half ago I decided I, I always say depending on the audience I've either gone to or come from the dark side um, but I am working with with AWS um, and, and I've now got the opportunity to work with 40, 50, 60 institutions and and really sort of discuss with them how they can uh, support their mission and empower students. So, um, yeah, that, that's the the quick journey. But uh, fantastic, Kevin! It's a great journey, and there's much more to come. I have no no doubt about that. But Kevin, <laughs> can I ask you? So, what was really that driver that took you down the road of looking at introducing gamification to education? I'm interested to know how you got started. In that mm. what drove you to understand that that <laughs> could be a game changer. I think some of it was time. And as I mentioned in, in the book, um, the first chapter or whatever, I'm, at my age, right, when, when I was just starting to become independent and wander the streets of Whitley Bay, which is a small town outside Newcastle, was when coffee shops started to get these things called Space Invaders machines in. And for, for you know, five or 10p, I think you could play this game. And it was weird. It was just a weird new world that sort of opened up right at that time. 1978, we had Star Wars and we had Space mm -hmm. Invaders. Both kind of came out. Um, so it felt like there was this new sort of technology thing that had landed on our doorstep. Um, as I progressed without really a clever plan, but into education, I, I traveled to Japan and taught English language um, to classes that could be 50 students who were really shy and really not looking to engage at all, culturally as well as, as sort of intellectually. I had to kind of pull ideas out of, of anywhere. So, you know, being sort of energetic, I would try different things try and engage, looking at what we could uh, use from, from um, these new games and environments to maybe try and connect people, um, you know, even just basic use of video, et cetera, et cetera. So my whole sort of professional career then became, how the heck do I get people engaged? And as I transitioned that into academic study, I started to bump into people who were just doing this really well and in really different ways. But I realized at some level that they were all using elements of things that were really engaging about like Star Wars and Space Invaders and emerging technology. And some of it was by intent and some of it was serendipitous. But as I continued my research, I kind of pulled all that together. And I thought the, the, the main environment where people are doing really interesting work fits under this G word and We've talked about this, Grania, but I, I sometimes hesitate with gamification and, and talk sometimes rather about gameful design because mm -hmm. gamification feels like it's an on-off switch. It's either a game or it's not, mm -hmm. whereas gameful design takes the elements of gamification and says, why do they engage people? And then plugs some of them back in. And we'll, we'll get to this a little later in the discussion. But if you look at the research and it's people who, who have looked at things like Flow, so Csikszentmihalyi, the famous Ukrainian who know, who's, whose name no one can spell, um, he did all this work into Flow. And when I teach this subject, my first question to students is think of an experience you have where the time goes quickly, whether that's playing a sport, reading a book, watching a movie. Think about a time when time goes, an experience you have when time goes quickly, and then let's break that down a little bit. And conversely, Think about maybe an experience that seems to drag. And, and you know what comes up quite often? Things like reading a PDF online, <laughs> right? So, so we yeah. know there are formats and environments that don't work, right? Read this 50-page PDF and then post on a discussion board is hard. It's hard to do. And when I proofread online, I miss a thousand things. Yeah. And I, even when I print it out, I'm kind of like, wow, how did I miss that? So we know there are things that, that demotivate and make time drag. We know there are things that seem to 
get you in this flow state. Yeah. And this this combination of, of instructors who were just great teachers, but they were trying some new things and were enhancing certain elements that were in common with things like games really kind of, again, fired my enthusiasm. Um, and the book is really talking about that. It's not me. Yeah. It's just me reflecting some great work that people who were great teachers did. And my categorization of, of that, if you like, was that the, these are all gameful or gamified elements and therefore people don't need to be frightened about this being a huge on off switch. It's a, you know, try some of these elements, some of these things you'll be doing anyway, as we'll, we'll yeah. discuss, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, fantastic. I, I really like that about thinking about an experience where time goes really fast. I think that's a really mm. critical, critical thing to, for us all to question here and that flow state. And Kevin, on that, then, can you talk a little bit about from the student or the learner perspective, what you feel are those motivators? So when what is helping them to get into this kind of flow state, if you like? Yeah, um, motivators. I actually was 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 reflecting on this this morning in, in prep and, and was flicking through one of my case studies. Um, and one of the professors, Neil Nyman, who was at University of New Hampshire, super, super guy. Um, just great fun and very intelligent and, and lots of energy. Um, he just talked about the crippling effect of fear of failure, right? And, and just to pick that one element, right? You think about how many times we've heard students say, oh, I can't do this. I never could do math. So oh, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm going to drop the yeah. class. And then you watch them maybe try a game or a, or a sport that they quite like. Let's say they want to try golf, right? Yeah. Everyone's terrible at golf when they start. I'm still terrible at golf. <laughs> and yet I still go because it's got other hooks. It's got things that engage me, um, both the aesthetics, the challenge, the immediate feedback. There's so many things in that sport that mitigate the fear of failure. So I still don't want to be crap at golf, but I still kind of am. But I keep going because of the other motivators. So it's sort of these things, I think, build on each other. Neil certainly identified fear of failure as a as a key element and and let's say we finish the conversation there please everyone listening go away try and reduce fear of failure in your course mm. however you do that you know give students lots of practice give them other, other examples give them opportunities to retake things you've just reduced fear of failure which is a gameful element and your student engagement will incrementally improve now you start to layer some of these other things on and some of my other practitioners focused on other areas the collaboration communication piece yeah. right the the um the the correct term of art for this um I'll, I'll not go the 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 correct term philosophically for or, or psychologically for this is is the dependent hero contingency right so if you're in a group and it's not kevin is going to fail it's team mm. shark or whatever it's it's yeah. the team might fail or might succeed and my part is important in that then I get this encouragement to be part of a team that wins, but also the support of it not being me in isolation. Right. So this dependent hero contingency, also known colloquially as the Harry Potter syndrome mm. of being in teams is another means of reducing fear of failure, but also increasing collaboration and throwing in a bit of competition. So you start to see you, you could maybe just try reducing fear of failure. And then if you put in a bit of team activity, you suddenly start to layer on top of that some more motivators. And I feel they've got this sort of multiplier. And we've, we've got a couple of slides to show. But when, I, when I've when i taught this and, and in the book, I put these key elements that seem to keep coming up, right? So I, I did the grunt work. I read through all of the books and, and whatever. And if you look at Chick sent me high and you look at Jesse Shell from Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. and you look at Carl Cap, who is probably the best guy Carl Cap, both with K's, K-A-P-P. -P. Um, there, there are very many, there, there are maybe 20 or so or 15, but I boiled them down to this list, which mm. I think is 10 or 11, of, of ones that I saw that were consistent. So, you know, fear of failure, second bottom right there. Um, they're, they're not ranked uh, in, in hierarchy, sure. but, but fear of failure is a key one. And when I've worked with academics developing courseware and, and class materials, we've said, let's look at these. And you don't have to do them all, but the, the silly thumb thing was just a, a grading uh, process that I had. And I don't know if you noticed on the previous slide, I think it'll reload if I do it cleverly. We do a pre-class analysis of some activities. And then we say, right, through your work and through maybe a couple of, of um, technological add-ons, is there any way that we can move this 
up and forward. And I think in a minute, the slide refreshes and the thumbs go over mm -hmm. to my right, possibly your left. But again, it doesn't have to be all things to all people. So if you look at the fourth bottom on the narrative, I think that's the one that people struggle with the most because it feels like to make a game, I've got to create this land with characters and people and costumes and dungeons and dragons. And, and if you're into that, great. One of my case studies is Gerald Petrozella at, yes. at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, super guy, very geeky gamey, and he could sell it and he could carry it. And he had students turn up for their finals for a, a debate, a Socratic sort of debate. He had them turn up in costume. For his that that's the kind of commitment and and you know engagement that he got. They didn't just complete a final and walk out the door. They showed up in costume to argue against each I other. Love that. He could, he yeah. could sell the Dungeons and Dragons. I probably yeah. couldn't. And as Neil Nyman says, you you do have to watch because you know. Let's be honest, we're all getting up there. Mm -hmm. And if I go in and go, hey, I'm going to do a Doctor Who narrative, and the students are like, who are you, Granddad? Yeah. Right. So <laughs> you've got to think about yeah. the students. Neil Nyman's Neil Nyman's famous quote was, "I have sweaters or jumpers that are older than half my students." So <laughs> if you create a narrative, you need to be able yeah. to sell it. A yeah. lot of people want to duck out on the narrative or give the narrative to the students. Nyman, in the end, said to the students, "Create your own narrative," and they did. But some of these other elements, as I've said before, good teachers do this anyway. There are very few teachers who say, ah, I, I think it's terrible giving feedback to students. I think it's terrible if the students have a good level of challenge. You know, my goal is to make it too difficult for everyone or too easy for everyone. No one says that. Yeah. 99.999% of instructors want that class to be engaging and want it to be, you know, interesting and motivating for students. And if you look at this list, this comes from the literature. I came up with the brilliant acronym the student intrinsic motivators and personalized learning environments because it's spelled simple and okay. then rarely rarely have used that at all um because <laughs> learning management systems doesn't quite work which is doesn't quite generally work that way that's um, right we'll, yeah. we'll work i'll take i'll take suggestions um but i would say if you're looking at gamification and thinking could i do a bit of this am i maybe going to dabble pick three of these pick four of them pick the four ones that you think yeah i get that and i'm into that and i want to do a bit of that and if you layer some of those things on, you may or may not want a narrative to frame it. And if you do get a narrative and do get buy-in, I think it really sustains the interest for a long period. So it, it is worth looking at. But if it's not for you, great, try some of the other ones. And, and I think now's the time because you do now have technology that can help you provide that feedback and can help you automate some of these things and can help with the the aesthetics and, and the student mm -hmm. control, right? We've talked about student-centric learning for 20 years. We've now got tools and systems, many of them AWS partners, end of commercial, um, who will help you with this. Uh, obviously, Quitch being one of them. I don't need to end the commercial. What am I doing? So, you know, you've got a lot of emergent technologies that can help you accentuate or megaphone some of these impacts. And I think that's what I'm now seeing. My research is, is eight, nine, 10 years ago but the principles are still there and i think we can reapply these principles um to this new ai chat gpt world um and and the, i've only got this one more slide so i'll flick it on yeah please. the key thing to remember when you're looking at competition collaboration etc cetera, etc cetera, those are the things that chat gpt can't do right and and i came across this phrase i'm not sure a pronunciation but i'll go with moravec's paradox and it's true right things that a five-year-old does has fun collaborates communicates fight you know all those things, a five-year-old can sense a room really quickly. A five-year-old can come into a room and can tell if people are angry or happy. Chat GPT can't do that. So I think the added benefit that's only just sort of emerged in the last few months is a lot of this gamification, gameful design really helps students express and leverage the human elements that if you're writing a paper or answering a multiple guess quiz, you maybe don't get. So. I'm excited all over again because of some of the things that are emerging at the minute. But sorry, I, I go on a bit. No, Kevin, that's <laughs> this is this is why we have you here. This is what we want to talk about. So this is fantastic. A couple of other because we're going to go to the audience in a second for questions, mm -hmm. um, Kevin. But just before we do that, um, in in terms of what you're seeing out there, you talked about the forty to fifty institutions and so on. Is mm. it your view or what is your view, I guess, about is gamification, is it being implemented in educational programs at a rate you would expect? And if not, what do you think those barriers are? 
I, I think de definitely elements are, and again, I'll leave this one up because I think this is the, the sort of key one. I certainly see instructors doing a lot of this. So things like your immediate continual feedback, right? Although it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, but if you look at some of the things that we're doing with chatbots, particularly in student support, not for the qualitative life-changing feedback elements, but for the dog ate my homework, I think there's a metric of around 80% of pretty fundamental or foundational or nuts and bolts elements that people just want to check in on. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we can help automate 80%, then the instructor has a lot more time to either help more students or start to think about things like narrative and competition, the human bits. So I think I'm seeing that move towards automation of some of the fundamentals, which is now freeing up people to be creative. And, and that's my encouragement. Now is the time, right? We're going to post COVID. We either go back to the way it was, or we say, right, what can we take advantage of? You know, Zoom, That's right. you know, or the, the synchronous tools, they have their benefits, right? And, and when I have discussions now about what back to school means or back to uni, you know, certain things you want to do face to face, but please don't make it didactic PowerPoint lecturing, mm -hmm. right? The students are showing, they're not showing up for that. But if you're going to do gameful interaction, collaboration, communication, cooperation, blah, 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 if you're going to do that in class, then as my case studies show, the students will, will absolutely flock. We haven't really talked about the quant of, of some of the textbook. Most, most of the instructors are doing fairly small units. And I think that is a challenge. Trying to gamify a 200 student lecture hall is, is a challenge. But, you know, that's sort of 10 to 20 students, 30 students. If you, can element, if you can throw some of these elements in, the students will show up. As I mentioned, you know, Gerald's class, they showed up in costume. Uh, yeah. One of my case studies does a, a sort of uncovering a, a terrorist plot uh, in, in a Homeland Security course. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's like Clue or Cluedo. They have to work out who did it, where, when, how. And it's just, it, it's think of um, escape rooms, right? We, they're fun, right? Students turn, if your class every day is like an escape room level of challenge and they have to collaborate and think outside the box, the students show. So, so I'm seeing it in terms of some of the fundamentals, some of the mundane bits being potentially automated and I think we're starting to free that up. I haven't seen a mass expansion of it, but I think certain elements we can see, people are really starting to think about immediate continual feedback. They're really starting to think about, you know, appropriate level of challenge and collaboration. And, and we sometimes call them soft skills or transitional skills. But I think for that paradox, those are the human skills that you really want to instill to make people employable and, and you know, great representatives of your, your institution. I would agree, Kevin. Fantastic, Kevin. On that note, let's um, and hmm. um, we'll stop sharing for a moment, and let's okay. see if we've got some questions there, and see what the audience have to say. Thanks so much, Kevin. Okay. So we've got lots of participants. We've got people, Kevin, from the US, the UK, France. That'll be, that'll be my mum from the UK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm going to hand it over to the audience for a moment and see if there's any questions there. If, you, if you'd prefer, rather than put in the chat function, let us know if you want to ask any questions directly. We can organize that. You might have given everyone too much to think about, Kevin. Oh, sorry, fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just wait for a second. Have we got any, any further questions? Because there is some here, Kevin. One of the, <laughs> one of the things that's come up is that idea about um, getting students, so we, you know, you get students into the university, but we have that obligation to keep them in the system or otherwise they're actually going to be worse off. And it was something I think you raised in your book that really stood out to me. That fact that if we get them into the system, we have that obligation to make sure we're providing an experience that is engaging for them and that will help them to continue on. Otherwise, they're in a worse position in the sense you talked about yeah. that they now have these fees that they have to pay and they've ended up with actually nothing, no degree, anything taken yeah. further. Could you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that and what your view is around that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I'm going to reference Gerald, the guy at, at MCLA again, Gerald Petrozella. Um, he did a lot of work in this space and the analysis bit, probably more than my other case studies. And he saw a few things. One, um, so, so he was teaching a philosophy class and um, it, was, it was what they call a general ed class in the US, which means you kind of all have to do a bit of liberal arts, 
even if you're a science major or you're doing business, you still have to do some liberal arts. So a lot of students were doing it almost under protest, didn't want to do it, weren't interested, philosophy, oh, Socrates, whatever, you know, when, when am I going to use that? Um, so that notion of early engagement, he felt that the gameful elements or the gamification really helped students get from the why am I doing this? I don't understand it, don't like it, to, you know what, philosophy is kind of interesting. And he saw an uptick in students who subsequently declared philosophy as their major, which is kind of a big deal, right? You're coming in thinking, oh, I'm going to do business. I've got to do this damn philosophy thing. And then you get so into it that you go, you know what, I'm going to change my major and do philosophy. So he had a sense that gamification, gameful design is really great for, again, I think a lot of it's that reduced fear of failure and maybe collaboration. You know, you're in a team, maybe you, you haven't help from your colleagues, your, your collaborators, and you're not frightened of failing because, you know, I tried it, didn't quite work, but I'm going to try again. In a game, you try it, you fail, you get annoyed, you do it again. Yeah. In education, you try it, you fail, you go, ah, what was I thinking? So yeah. that notion that gamification can bridge from uh, nervousness or lack of enthusiasm to commitment he, he said, you know, once you get to a certain level, probably like golf, right? To go back to my earlier example, once you get to a certain level, it is actually really engaging and in interesting and exciting. When you get to be good at something, you tend to want to stick at it. Stick so at if it. you get beyond apathy and or resistance to quite enjoying philosophy, then you will probably enjoy philosophy for the rest of your life. So he felt two things. That bridge was important. And then also he talked about democratization of participation, because whether we like it or not, and he identified this as a white male, as do I, we ask students questions, the students who look like us, the students who catch our eye, the students who are a bit more confident. And he had student feedback that said, you know, it's great, because in most classes, there's 20, 30, 40 people and the same three people answer the questions. And if it's a game and you have to take a turn and you have to be involved and maybe you're part of a team, so you're a little bit sheltered, there's more involvement. So he saw two things, that that bridge to engagement and motivation and then democratization of participation, which meant even the shyest, quietest student was, was actually getting involved. So I think those are critical. And as you say, yeah, drop out partway through education, all you've got is debt and no qualification. So it's yeah. it's essential and... These practitioners that, that were doing this work, I, I think were, you know, really doing important work and I've tried to implement elements of that going forward. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Mm -hmm. Kevin Moore, just about out of time. So just to, to be respectful of, of everyone's time, I, I would though like to give you kind of, can you give us the kind of final words of wisdom or a few words of wisdom you would say to a lot of the people in this um, audience today mm -hmm. are educators or they're from institutions they could be from the big four there's government people just in terms of what are some things they could take away from today to help mm -hmm. them to implement an, an engaging way of learning or gamified design as as you put it i would say obviously you know as i mentioned before now i think is the time because because i was doing this and and looking back to personal learning environments learning management systems with word doc no disrespect to microsoft products but with word documents and powerpoints in a yeah. basic lms and these guys got extreme engagement. And we fast forward now and we're starting to look at AR, VR. We're looking at digital twins. We're looking at IoT. We're looking at students doing experiential projects that pull on real world information to see how they're doing. So I think the potential is massive there now. And from the student perspective, even going back to the simple environments, students were so thankful that people were trying stuff. Yes. that they were super tolerant. And all my practitioners were like, oh, I wish I had better technology. I wish I'd kept mm -hmm. ahead of it a bit more. A lot of the processes were manual. And yet the students were still saying, you know what, that didn't matter. It was great that you gave it a go. So I think you'll find a massively receptive audience. It's great that you give it a go. I think we've got ed techs, including Quitch and others who are doing some really engaging work and can be implemented really simply. Um, and I think just now's the time. It, it's really time to give it a go. And we, we owe it, right? We've all got targets in higher ed. We want better participation. We want, you know, those who haven't had all the advantages in life to get a fair go. Yes. Um, so I think, I think, you know, yes, there's a bit of a leap. But as I've shown with those motivators, you can take a leap with a couple of things that you're already doing and just amplify those and then track the positive results and then go and sell it to your provost or your DVCA and say, look, I tried this. Can I go for it? Can I get ten thousand yeah. dollars of funding to give it a go? Yeah. And um, yeah, I think I think now's the time. I'd, I'd love to engage. I'm on LinkedIn. I think we share the details. 
uh, happy oh, to yes. connect and yeah, uh, yeah. keep the conversation going. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. We should, yeah, let's um, share the details so people can follow up with us afterwards. But I think, Kevin, you said something really important there. We owe it to them. And I think that's exactly right. We have to provide that experience that we know is going to work work, work for them. And as you said, there is just, there's a few things that we can do to help, you know, get get help people get, get started. So I'm just, so Kevin, can I say a huge thank you on behalf of everybody who is here today? This has been a fascinating discussion. I'd actually could go and have continued this for the next couple of hours <laughs> quite easily. So I think what we might do is have, have a part two at some stage. We will just for the audience as well. Um, Kevin and I, we have recorded the session and we will share that with you. And so please do follow up with us. You've got our details here if you have any questions. And Kevin, again, a huge thank you. Thanks so much for your for your time today. I truly appreciate it, as does I know everyone here today. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening and, and keep in touch. Good luck, everyone. Game on, as they say. <laughs> Game on, indeed. Thanks so much, everybody.